In the run-up to Christmas 1910, no one working at the Pretoria Pit at Halton Colliery was aware their lives were about to change. On December 21st, 1910, disaster struck at the Pretoria Pit. An explosion caused the deaths of 344 men and boys. The youngest to die was 13-year-old Frederick Stanley Horton, who was working his first day at the pit. The eldest was 62-year-old William Turton. By the time of his death, he had worked in mines for 50 years. The Pretoria Pit disaster was the third worst mining disaster in the history of the United Kingdom. In the wake of the disaster, a relief fund was set up to aid the families of those lost. The Halton Colliery Explosion Fund was set up by the Mayor of Bolton to accept charitable donations and compensate the families, the last payment being made in 1975. What follows are two lives who were affected by the disaster and how the fund helped them to continue their lives in the wake of such tragedy. My name is Annie and I lost my husband in the Pretoria Pit disaster. I was 29 when John died. We had four children and I was pregnant with our fifth. It was hard looking at life without my husband, the breadwinner. John had earned the money to look after us, to keep a roof over our head and food on our plates. I often wondered how I could cope without him. I was lucky that there was a relief fund which gave me some security without John, especially as I was expecting another child. One day though, I had a visit from the society. I don't know who had reported me, but reported I was, accused of misconduct, because I was out when they visited at nine at night. I was, in their opinion, up to no good. I can't remember now where I had been, but if I had caused any issues for anyone, I am sorry. But they said I had been out with different men in taxis at night, and I had not. I told them then that I denied it, and I deny it again now. They told me, though, that if I was suspected of misconduct again, I would lose my money. Can you imagine? It's the only real security I have now that I am a widow. The fund is the only money I can guarantee coming in. Their opinion never changed though. To them, I am an unrespectable, but my children are still looked after, and that is all I can ask. When Edna was 14, she was so unwell, had boils on her body and anemia. Poor lass couldn't work or anything. Whatever the people at the fund thought of me, they still helped my girl. Edna had worked in a mill, but she wasn't well. She needed extra nourishment. They were going to help her get into a convalescent home, but it took too long. When she got ill again a year later, they paid the fees and transport so she could go and get better. They never really helped me much after that but they had helped my girl and that's all I could ask for. I never remarried, but I had my children. I am lucky to have survived the loss of a husband and my children survived without their father, a man who would have earned enough to give us a life together. I'm John Baxter. I'm a recipient of the Lancashire and Cheshire Miners Relief Fund. They've done a lot for me over the years, including making the money permanent, meaning I'll receive money from them until I die. My father, whom I was named after, was a victim of the Pretoria Pit disaster of December 1910. I was only eight months old at the time, so I don't really remember him. I grew up living with my mother and sister Alice. As a young boy, I wasn't well, and ended up with paralysis in my upper right arm and my left foot. My mother did all she could do for me. She took me to all these doctors, but it meant that the bills were high. She had to take in laundry just to get money to survive. In 1922, the fund paid for me to see a specialist doctor in Liverpool. After the initial appointment, I was sent to the hospital in Liverpool for surgery and treatment. The fund paid for it all. It improved the strength in my arm and leg. I have to have some electrical massage therapy. I had it for another two years. It really helped me health, and by the end of the treatment I was able to walk the two and a half miles home several times a week. I never thought that would be possible. Without the fund, this treatment wouldn't have happened. The surgery alone would have been too expensive for my family to afford, and so I would still be living with the paralysis left behind from my childhood illness. This was not the only time they supported me. 
When I finished school at 14, I could not get any work due to my health. The fund got me into a commercial training institute in order to get the professional training needed to get work. They paid for the institute, my books, everything. My mother had found that in order for us to move over to Australia, I would need to have guaranteed support from the relief fund because of my health. It wasn't guaranteed I would get work. My mother contacted the fund. They were helpful, but I couldn't get a decision before I was accepted to Australia. They sent medical reports to the Australian Embassy on our behalf and supported us in the process of getting a decision. We found out in November 1928 that I could not go to Australia due to my poor health. I eventually got a job at West Horton Petrol Station in 1930 and have been working on and off ever since. The fund still provided me with support by providing money for my clothes and boots. I needed new boots every so often because of my problems. The fund are so good to help me provide them. I now have a beautiful family of my own. And if it had not been for all of the support the fund has given me over the years, my life would probably be very different. And for that, I am grateful. These are just two stories from the victims' families. There were only three survivors that fateful day in December. The support the victims' families received helped many of them up until their own passing. Without it, many may not have survived or enjoyed the improvements and opportunities the fund had provided. To find out more, contact Wigan Archives and Local Heritage or pop over to their Facebook page.